Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Project Management for Large-Scale Projects by Dr. Bill Peterson. The webinar today is part of ASEM's Academic Partnership Webinar Series. My name is Ane Bue. I am the series coordinator and the moderator for the presentation today. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Informatics and Engineering Systems at the University of South Carolina of State. I'm also the student membership director for ASEM. Before we get started, um, I would like to go over a few items so that you know how to participate in today's event. <laughs> Excuse me. I also have a few announcements about upcoming events. This session is being recorded and we plan to make the recording available to you. Mute your microphones and turn off your camera. So it's important that you mute your mic to avoid um, background noises that may distract you from listening to the webinar. You'll have the opportunity to submit your questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the chat box in the control panel. Uh, you may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. Uh, we will collect these questions and address them during the 10-minute Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. The next webinar in the Academic Partnership Series is on March 4th. Ms. Kristen Egan, a systems engineer at Raytheon, will be speaking about how to differentiate yourself as a performer. Registration for the webinar is open on the website, so please sign up early uh, because there are limited seats available. On April 8th, Ms. Anne-Marie Uliano, a project manager at Bill Health, We'll be discussing about how you can find internships and how to maximize the value of your internship. In addition, the final two webinars in the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion webinar series, co-sponsored by ASEM and the Engineering and Computing Education Program at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, are on February 18th and March 25th. Uh, this is a popular webinar, uh, webinar series, and there are limited seats, so please sign up early. If you're not currently a member of ASEM, please consider becoming one. Uh, ASEM membership has many benefits. As an ASEM member, you will receive a discounted rate for ASEM certifications, including the Certified Professional in Engineering Management, CAEM, and the Certified, so certified Associate in Engineering Management, CAEM, and the Certified Professional in Engineering Management, CPEM. The certification exam prep is available, uh, so please visit the Society's website for additional information. Students can become ASEM members through the Academic Partnership Program. This program facilitates a simple and cost-effective approach for student groups to become ASEM members. So visit the Academic Partnership Program website for additional information. Now, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Bill Peterson. Dr. Peterson is the Engineering Director for Lake Superior Consulting in the Duluth, Minnesota office. He is a professional engineer in 18 states and is the inventor on 47 U.S. patents and numerous international patents. He graduated from the United States Naval Academy and received his master's degree and PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Washington. Since leaving the Navy, Dr. Peterson has worked the last 25 years in engineering and management in manufacturing, design, and consulting. Currently, he is seconded to Whitewater 
midstream in Austin, Texas as a compressor station program project manager for the two year long Whistler project. Hello, Dr. Peterson, uh, thank you for joining us today. I'll hand the presentation over to you. Sounds good, thanks, Lona. I appreciate it. What a great program you guys have put together. I think it's uh, really fortunate for people to be able to participate in something like this. So thanks also for me being able to, to uh, present. So um, without further ado, I'm probably gonna jump in here, but uh, I wanna put a couple of things in context as I talk through this, um, you know, what is a major project or a large scale project? It really is relative to what's going on in your world at any moment in time. But in the context of this project, it's really multi-billion dollar project, thousands of people, um, hundreds of organizations being involved, large period of time. And you're gonna have teams and sub teams that form that collapse, that move on as, as the needs go throughout the project. And ultimately that formation of teams, that success of that leadership and the coordination of those teams, that's really where the project management team comes together to make all of that happen. I'm fortunate enough to have been a part of this project and uh, you know, fantastic group that I worked with. So the things we're gonna talk about today during my presentation are, I'm gonna talk about a safety moment and the importance of those, frankly, in your projects. We'll talk about an overview of the project with its key project management aspects. What I think are the keys to success about it. And we'll finish up with some Q&A and uh, certainly I am available for follow-up too if, if people have other things that uh, come up in the future. But, hey, I didn't pick it up. I'm not gonna bore you with a lot of talk about me, but I will wanna say that I've had a very diverse background and that diversity of my background has really strengthened every phase of my life and every phase professionally of the things that I accomplish. And that started way back when I was working on the farm, age 13, where six days a week, 12 to 16 to 18 hour days, all summer long, that's how I paid for you know, my standard of living in high school and frankly in college as well. Um, so that taught me an awful lot of things. And you know, some of those things that it taught me were, guess what? If those tractor tires aren't going around and around, nothing's happening behind me. There's nobody going to accomplish that work if it's not me. And uh, so what I learned from that is really uh, people pay you to get stuff done. They don't pay you to work on stuff. They don't pay you to look good in the office. They pay you to get stuff done. So when you get in the office, get it done. And also the other thing I learned is, you know, frankly, uh, I hear a lot about work-life balance. You know, um, if you're not the best in your field and you are not the most capable and most effective person, um, then you're probably shorting yourself by trying to find a work-life balance that may in fact be shorting yourself as in your professional growth. I'll tell you, you know, I've got uh, 30 some years of professional experience, probably with an average of 70 hour weeks. Just run the numbers. That's the equivalent of having 50 years of experience as opposed to had I chosen to limit myself to 40 hour weeks like many people choose to do today. Um, you know, 30 years experience is still a lot, but I promise you the extra 20 <laughs> as it's added up through, through my career adds up. So find that work-life balance and you'll find phases in your life where 40 hours is all you can work, but there are phases in your life that you should be working far more than that. And you start a new job, put in the time, put in the energy, learn how to do it. So um, learn a lot of that, frankly, on the farm. Um, went to the Naval Academy, served my country, very proud of that. Served, that's USS Nimitz. I was on that for several years. Um, and, you know, some of the stuff I learned there besides a lot of the technical stuff of pumps, valves, uh, nuclear reactors, frankly, uh, on there. Um, what I learned is that you need to talk to your technicians. As an engineer, you graduate, or an engineering manager, you graduate, you feel like you know everything, and the fact is you know nothing. Um, so go to your technicians, ask them to help you become a good engineer or a good manager, and they will take you under their wing and they will help you be successful. Without that humility, without that interaction with them, you're not going to be as successful. So uh, please make sure you take the time to do that. 
Um, like I said, I worked a lot in manufacturing. In manufacturing, you know, hey, 5S, organization, procurement, logistics, and, and all of those skills, data analytics, all of those skills are critical to the success of a major project. If you cannot do it yourself, that's okay. But that means you're going to have to hire somebody to do it because those functions are critical. So the more that you can do, the more you can understand, the more success you can help your team achieve. Um, I, I uh, along the way, uh, have been an expert witness and an expert witness through many court cases. And frankly, I learned how to read and how to execute a well-written legal document. Make no mistake, as project manager, you need to read those contracts in great detail. You need to understand the nuances of those contracts and what they mean. And if you don't understand it, get the technical help, get the professional help, get the legal help to make sure that those contracts are written well. Uh, frankly, contracts can avoid a whole lot of conflict later on in a project if you address it right up front. If it's in the contract, there's no scope uncertainty. If it's not in the contract, it's either going to be a change order that you're paying for it, or you're going to be getting a favor from your contractor to execute it. So if you want it done, it's got to be in writing. So every one of the aspects of my life have parlayed into further improvement in the following and subsequent aspects. And, you know, every one, I've been able to meet some great people like Ghana and Ona on the call here. I learned uh, and met them when I was at University of Minnesota Duluth. Uh, working as a professor there. And above all else, the things I've, I believe and stand behind are absolute integrity. you got to stand behind what you do. If you screw up, own it. It's okay. Hard work. There's no substitute. And dig in, learn the details, do your best always. Um, have a positive attitude. Have fun doing what you're doing. Have fun working with the team that you have. And if you find that you're on a team that's not having fun, you really need to reflect. Why is that team not being successful having fun executing? Is it that they are dysfunctional as a team or that they're not good at what they do? Or is it both? Either way, as a leader of that team, you got to figure out how to overcome that. Um, and effective communication is super important. Simplify communication. Get it directed to a particular purpose. And one of the things in today's world, it's really interesting to me. I grew up before email. I grew up before cell phones. And um, many of the junior engineers that I work with, not to pick on them, but they are scared to pick up the phone and call a vendor. And I'm going to give you a very simple rule that has been absolutely game changing for me throughout my career because I, in case you can't tell, I am an alpha personality, and if you send a email, it will always be perceived negatively, particularly if it's a pushing or driving or, you know, important email in that regard. If you make a phone call addressing the same exact issue in the same exact way, people will understand you're trying to work together to find a solution to the challenge. In an email, people will receive it negatively every time. So when you have something negative, communicate it verbally or in person. If you have something positive, communicate it in writing or in email. An email is permanent and an email will be distributed much farther and wider than what you ever think. So those are my, those are my career things. Um, good luck as, as you uh, strike out on your own. Now, one of the things that um, I want to address here is a uh, safety moment. The project I'm going to talk about here was an oil and gas project. And in oil and gas, every major meeting will start off with a safety moment. That isn't to say 100% of them are going to have safety moments because by the time you're on your eighth or 10th meeting in the day talking to the same people, you probably don't need to have another safety moment. But guaranteed, the first one of that day will have a safety moment. For the first one of that week, we'll have a safety moment. What is a safety moment? Safety moment is where you talk about safety instances or near misses that happen and how you're going to prevent them. And these are absolutely critical to the success. This 
project that we're going to talk about today had several million man hours associated with it with no major injuries. Now, there are some slips, trips, and falls kind of stuff that are marginally preventable. People trip and break their arm. Those things are going to happen anytime you have thousands of people uh, working in an industrial setting. However, um, to keep your people safe is your job as project manager. And once you start having safety moments, you'll find that you do this in your own personal life. Frankly, I've got two young men that I'm extremely proud of that, you know, hey, there we are, we're building a garage in our backyard. I start that off with a safety moment. Guys, here's what we're gonna accomplish. We're gonna be putting up the walls today. Here are the safety concerns. Here's the PPE we're gonna wear and here's how we're gonna keep each other safe to the point of if I'm up on a ladder, someone's gonna be spotting me on that ladder. If I'm up above and I've got a hammer in my hand, you know, no one's gonna be below me. Those kinds of things really, really matter. And uh, so documented every day with the JSA, your job safety analysis and keep your people safe. A little bit about Lake Superior, the company that I work for. Um, we are headquartered in Duluth, Minnesota. We have eight office locations, including our newest in Nashville, Tennessee. We've got uh, an office out in Pittsburgh. We've got one in Colorado. We've got offices in Houston. Um, bottom line is we're a national corporation with a full service design and service portfolio with over 30 disciplines of engineering and technician support, both for in the field as well as in the office. We got a, a portfolio right now of over 500 clients that we've worked with and uh, certainly very uh, heavily focused in oil and gas, but we also do a lot of general engineering. We do a lot of mine work. We do a lot of uh, general structural work, general civil work, uh, a lot of diverse projects, to be honest. I think in today's world, um, maybe even exactly today, to be honest, um, any discussion about an oil and pipeline uh, this is actually a natural gas project that we're talking about today, which really doesn't even matter. And frankly, uh, when Ona asked if I'd be willing to do this, this was eight months ago or six months ago, something like that. I didn't know that this was going to be the political hot button that it is today. So I'm going to try to stay away from the politics of this, but I do want people to understand the need of critical infrastructure, such as pipelines. Um, and if we talk about natural gas, for example, there's more than 3 million miles of natural gas pipelines currently in the United States. And to be honest, it's not enough or people wouldn't be building more. Um, it, that may sound crazy, but I got to tell you that that chemical energy in natural gas is critical to everything that we do. Our energy in energy portfolio in the United States is really about one third transportation, about one third heating and commercial and industrial uses, and about one third electrical power generation. Now, if you were to watch the news today, you would really think that, oh my goodness, you know, solar farms and wind turbines are just about to power everything in our country. And, and uh, you know, they are less than 4% of our power portfolio currently. And um, so I live in Duluth, Minnesota. It was 20 below. Fahrenheit, for those of you who are not US this morning. So 20 below, um, let's put that in context. We have about seven days of natural gas storage in the United States, meaning we can consume every little bit of natural gas that's out there in our system in seven days. Well, wind is available one third of the time. Solar is available one quarter of the time. So if we turned off natural gas in this country and we didn't have the wind blowing or the sun shining, how quickly do you think there would be major issues with death, doom, and destruction, frankly, uh, at 20 below? You know, I challenge you to think about some of those things and think about maybe uh, finding a replacement for things that we need before we stop the things that we need and uh, try to pretend that uh, other things can replace it before they're mature enough technologies to do it. And the other thing 
I apologize, but I, I have to ask the question. Um, if you do not know that there are several General Motors manufacturing plants shut down for a couple months right now, and there are Ford Motor Company uh, factories shut down, the reason they're shut down is because they don't have enough silicon chips to put the circuit boards into those cars. How in the world are we going to make enough circuit boards to replace 99% of the rest of our energy in the United States? Uh, yeah, good luck. So huge issue. So those of you who uh, would like to learn more on that, I strongly, strongly encourage you to go to the Energy Information Agency. Tons and tons of treasure trove of information there. And you could really self-educate yourself reading at night. Over a couple of weeks, you could almost become an expert on energy in the in the United States and frankly the world, and really see what some of the alternatives that are actually viable could be. And before I got get off this topic one last time, if you look at the graph in the upper right, and you notice between 2020 and 2021, what you'll see is an increase in coal consumption in the United States, and the reason. Um, is because there was projected at the time of that graph being created that there could potentially be an administration change, which there has been. And so it's projected that the cost of natural gas would increase. And so, frankly, we're just going to burn more coal, which is obviously a lot less energy environmentally friendly than what natural gas is. So, honestly, our emissions are going to go up a lot from some of the the so-called uh, environmental policies being put in place today. And I'm not, I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, or Whig, <laughs> none of them matter to me. The fact is the technical side of energy production, consumption, and storage is something that we as a country really have to come to grips with. So um, now on this particular project that we're talking about, it really doesn't matter if we're talking about a natural gas pipeline or if we we're talking about a solar farm. Frankly, a solar farm is a lot easier to put in than this natural gas pipeline. A uh, uh, wind turbine is really a little bit of a civil scope. There, there's very little labor involved. You know, those projects are really sort of an afterthought in terms of coordination. Um, I'd be happy to do a lot of those. Frankly, I've been a part of several of those on the design side. I haven't actually been project managing on the execution of construction side. But like I said, those are small crews. So. Um, Back to this particular project, the specific role that I have is uh, the compressor stations for this large diameter pipeline. When I say large diameter, um, this is a 42 inch pipeline that was put in. And uh, so there are four natural gas powered compressor stations associated with that. And fundamentally what you have um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. I think you might be able to, but um, gas comes in from the lower left and it flows along and it goes through what appears to be a little component there that, it, can you guys see my screen, Ghana or Mona, or my mouse? Yes, I can see your mouse. Oh, you know what? I can annotate. How about that for high tech? Okay, so here's, that's the compressor right there. So we're gonna put in two compressors, what's called train A and train B, and then a whole bunch of supporting equipment. And no, these are not solar panels here in the middle. These are uh, heat exchangers to cool the gas because after the gas goes through the compressors, it's hot and so it needs to be cooled to be dumped back on. So we're gonna build this large system uh, and the whole purpose is that component and then a whole bunch of supporting infrastructure to do it. Um, each site, this particular site, if you were to look, this is a large reach man lift. And so uh, the top of that compressor is about probably 15 feet to the ground. So that's probably about 15 feet that I'm drawing right there. Um, so large project, a uh, lot of heavy lift equipment, a lot of safety concerns. Now, um, obviously, on the financial side of a project like this, uh, there were a lot of alternatives considered. For example, what if we lose utility power? 
here's about two megawatts of utility power comes in here. What happens when that utility power gets interrupted? We've got to have uh, something to back it up so that we can keep these systems running. We looked at battery storage and um, frankly, it wasn't even remotely close to financially viable. And this component right here is the emergency diesel generator. It's a two megawatt emergency diesel generator, probably 12 feet high here at the base. Those are steps going in from the right that you see. And that battery pack for 30 minutes, not even full use, it was, it was really powered down significantly to get us that 30 minutes. That battery pack was almost as big as that diesel enclosure right there. So um, I challenge you to find some batteries that do it, especially ones that are environmentally friendly and uh, can meet what amounts to the energy storage in those 3,000 gallons of diesel that are sitting there that are going to run that thing for 36 hours, um, in which case we'd be rolling trucks in with more diesel to keep power to it uh, if utility power weren't restored. So tremendous amount of technical infrastructure all shaking hands together is, is really the theory on this thing. So, all right. Um, my annotations stayed out there. Clear. There we go. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, project management basics don't overcomplicate it. It's all about scope schedule and budget and your number one task is to build a team that's going to be effective knowing that that team is going to have some folks are going to come in for a while their utility is going to be expired and they're going to move out of the project a good example might be the environmental consulting firm for air permitting that air permitting group will come in they will analyze the situation make sure we're doing all the right things to be good stewards of the environment to get the construction air permit from the regulating authority or authorities more likely um, get our paperwork in line so that we're documenting that appropriately through the years and through our construction process and that we're actually meeting our obligations of that permit and then once the utility of that team and that documentation is in place then they move on to another project and they'll be on the shelf hey they did a great job next time the project team will drag them up again to their next project and so when I call it a transient population, it really is uh, one in which you have to have people that, that come and go. And so you have to have the right expertise at the right time. And on a project team, what you're going to find is mainly type A personalities. You're going to have very driven people. And you're going to have people that work very hard. People are going to call you up on a Saturday. They're going to expect an answer. And, you know, uh, frankly, last night, I... I uh, you know, on a different project, uh, got a call at 8.30 at night. Hey, Bill, I need some of this. You know, jump on it, get it done, get it to them by 10.30 that night. That enables them to keep progressing. That's the kind of intensity you're going to have on a project. If you're not a high-intensity person, project work isn't for you. If you're a high-intensity person, and you love that, you get a little bit of feel from, yeah, this is fun, project work could be the right thing for you. Um, project team. Don't overcomplicate it. Everyone's got to know what to work on, have the tools to execute it, have the training to execute it, and the materials to execute it. Everything else is noise. And you as the leader of that project need to step back, keep the big picture in mind, keep a little bit of separation to where you don't go down the rabbit holes that are exciting to you. You got to keep the separation so that you can keep all the pieces of the puzzle coming together for that final image. And the key to it though is plan ahead, foresee the things that could be train wrecks upcoming and follow up. If you ask somebody to do something and you don't follow up and they don't get it done, it's your fault, it's not their fault because they're working on a priority basis too. So ask somebody to do something, follow up. And if they didn't get it done, ping on them, say, no, I, I need it by this date. And if they don't get it done, guess what? Next person up. That isn't a person you want on a project team. If they're not coming through, those people don't stick around. 
All right, major elements of this project, and I don't really want to dive too much into the front end development other than to express my appreciation for the folks that did that. Front end development, they need to see the vision for the need. They need to see the timing for it. We need to do the preliminary technical evaluation of engineering, environmental, permitting, all those things, put it together in a business case, and then have the guts to go for it. Multi-billion dollar project, you gotta convince investors who are very savvy, very knowledgeable, have done very many projects, have their own team of due diligence individuals looking at your project and convince them that, yeah, fine, here's a couple billion bucks, go, go play in the sandbox. And oh, by the way, when you return, we want more than a couple billion bucks back. Um, so those are the things, you know, those front end development folks, great job to them for something like this. This talk today is really execution side, um, where you're going to build a team. In this case, uh, there was really a pipeline team and stations team. And those scopes of work are related. They're similar. Some of them are the same people, but they're very different executed forms. So a pipeline a very linear scope of work. Picture a Model T factory that's moving hundreds of miles over the course of its execution. And so, gosh, one factory that moves isn't going to work. So we're going to divide it up into multiple factories that are all going to move in parallel, or some of them are going to move this way, and some are going to move this way. And you've got to have that overlap of that scope of work appropriate so that nothing falls through the cracks. And then the stations that are attached to that scope of work, you know, you can't have a, let's call it a 10 acre footprint just for argument's sake. You can't have thousands of people working at the same time on a 10 acre footprint. It won't work. So you have to time it out so that this several dozen are working on this time, this several dozen are working on this time, and we're going to work to keep them safe working together. Um, a lot of aspects to it, you know. Hey, we got to build. We got to first. We got to get access to the land. We're going to buy. We're going to lease the land. We're going to worry about driveways. We're going to worry about roads getting in. We're going to worry about how we're going to manage that infrastructure in the future. We're going to worry about our civil side. We're going to worry about our utility power, our environmental side, our engineering side, procurement and logistics, our construction. Actually, you know, gosh, construction's big on this but it's just one bullet of many. And then commissioning, of course, commissioning is really the testing of the assets to make sure that they're gonna perform the way that we had hoped when they do that. <clears throat> Civil pad construction, frankly, is expensive and it's an easy scope of work to get wrong because it's very easy for a civil contractor to inflate the price for them to execute stuff if you do not have a well-written contract. And most, in fact, of the civil contractors out there um, like to have a loose contract. They like to be your buddy, keep it loose. Hey, we're gonna keep this casual. Well, as project manager, that should raise a warning sign in your head every time you hear a casual handshake agreement those are great. You have to have that level of integrity and trust within the project. But if it's not written, it's not in the scope, and it's a change order, and change orders are going to be more expensive than that scope of work would have been had it been in the original contract. So make sure um, that you plan ahead for that, and make sure that you plan for the amount of work it's going to take to finish that pad because fundamentally, what you're going to do is you're going to go through all the steps to build this pad. And now you're going to say, OK, go ahead and bring in all the heavy equipment to build all the stuff on or under the pad. And they're going to tear that thing to shreds. But that's not what you're going to want at the end. So who's going to fix it? Well, you better coordinate that. Engineering is a big aspect of it. Um, oil and gas industry is very heavily dominated by mechanical engineers. Um, but of course there's chemical engineers, process engineers, electrical engineers, instrumentation engineers. There's tons and tons of disciplines necessary. But for those of you who are of a particular discipline, take the time to get good at the technical side and the fields that are outside of your education. Now, 
self-education is critical because I don't care how good of a school you went to, when you get to your job, that is when you're really going to learn how to be a good engineer or a good manager. And uh, if you do not take extra time on your own time to learn how to do these things better, you will never be as valuable to your employer and therefore to yourself as what you should be. And a good example on the upper left there, I know it's a little fuzzy and that's intentional. I apologize, but it's all proprietary information. That is what is called a PNID diagram or a process and instrumentation diagram. It is shocking to me how few people take the time to learn to be able to effectively read and understand a PNID. If you said I need one thing, one drawing, it would be the PNID. So learn how to read a PNID. And there are specific symbols. There will be a symbol legend on the front of it. And that will give you the keys to the castle to tell you what electrical things you need, what instrumentation you need, what equipment you need, what piping, what valving, et cetera, that you need, what major equipment you need for that project. And I don't care what type of project it is. If there is a mechanical component to it, there is a PNID, and that PNID will be the major driving drawing. Um, there's a lot of other drawings in the process world and mechanical. Don't underestimate those, but that's the one that matters. Electrical, um, you know, there's instrumentation, there's controls, there's comms. Every one of those matters, and every one of them is important. But if I had to have one drawing that I know, it's what's called a one-line diagram electrically. A one-line diagram is what shows me my major power components going to my motor control center that define how that power is getting to, I don't know, let's say that motor or that variable frequency drive for that startup motor for that turbine. So learn how to do the PNID, learn how to read the one-line diagram. And if you're a mechanical engineer or a chemical engineer, I don't care, learn how to read those diagrams. They are not that hard. You simply trace it out. And if you don't know how to read it and your, your boss is probably too busy, and frankly, your boss may not know how to read it, take the time on your own time to read it. Talk to the electrical engineers. Understand how to trace down all the circuits, all the cables, everything. It will make you so much more valuable. Um, a lot of civil structural work, a lot of analysis. Don't overlook the, the software that controls an HMI is a human machine interface. That's the screen that's going to be on a piece of equipment or at the station is an HMI. SCADA is the piece of equipment that's back at gas control. In this particular case, gas control is, you know, like a thousand miles away from the physical asset. That HMI is right at the physical asset. And full disclosure, this HMI screen had absolutely nothing to do with this project. It's just our screens were proprietary, um, and so I, I put somebody else's, just snagged it off the internet. So, mea culpa, mea culpa. But um, now, if you're a non-technical project manager, you are hindering your ability to do a technical project. If that's not intuitively obvious to the casual observer, I'm gonna say it again in a different way. If you're executing a technical project as project manager, you've got to get the technical knowledge to back up effective execution of that. You can rely on experts to carry you. You can rely on all that. But if, if you're not executing it yourself, you have to hire somebody to do that effort. If you are hiring somebody else to do that effort, why are you getting hired to execute that work? Now, to some degree, you're going to have, you can't do this as a, as a one person band. So, you are going to have to hire a team or teams or dozens of teams or hundreds of teams, depending on the size of the project. But you have to be able to tell you or have to be able to understand what those people are telling you. And it is so critical because scopes of work that made up to one another, there's always a scope of work that falls through the crack. And that will be what hurts you. You cannot put a system in operation unless cord A and cord B 
made up and have the same fitting on the end of them so they can connect. Wrong fitting in either one, somebody's got to fix it. Who's it going to be? So get your red lines. Your red lines are your drawing modifications. Get those from your contractors. Get them from your inspection crew. Requests for information. Those are the contractors out in the field. They can't understand something technically, or what it usually is, is they found an error. So they're requesting help. And it's interesting, but a lot of engineering firms, you send them an, an RFI, and they're like, okay, we got seven days to reply to that. No, that contractor was probably moving that day, meaning he had people physically in motion to execute that scope of work. And that's when they found the problem. So if you don't get back to them in a couple of hours with a solution, then they have to change direction, which costs them time, it costs them money. And if it's costing them time and money, you as project manager who's managing the business of your project, guess what? You're spending your own cash. So when you get your support team together, give them clear expectations. Hey, engineering team, guess what? When I get an RFI, you've got a maximum of 24 hours to reply. I expect to reply an acknowledgement of the need for that RFI within an hour. And honestly, most RFIs can be answered within an hour. And if it's not going to be answered within an hour, I want to know why. And frankly, I, as project manager, am either going to be looking for somebody else to support that, or else I'm going to be looking for a way to get you help. And if you're a project manager looking for other people to help other people that you're already paying, pretty soon you're not going to hire one of them. Um, this screen, I'm going to blow through it because I'm in typical fashion starting to run long. So um, power can come from utility or a co-op. Utilities are usually larger, usually much more organized. On the left, utility says, hey, here's a drawing set and the spec you got to follow. On the right, co-op says, hey, you know what? We put in something similar to that last year. Why don't you go look at what we put in for there and, and uh, we'll just do that again. So, you know, how you get your information to design your system. Um, procurement and logistics. I will just say that, uh, sorry, I just got a, a project text on a different project that was significant actually. Um, it's okay, it can wait 15 minutes. My folks are tackling it. But so procurement and logistics, um, right parts, right time, right quantity, right location, plan ahead, follow up. Logistics is absolutely critical. There were hundreds of millions of pounds of steel in this project, hundreds of millions of pounds. Um, Tell you what, I'm gonna blow through this video and I'm gonna to go to a different video. This is a time-lapse video of construction of one of the multiple locations. And you can see the helical piles that were put in place for the foundations. Um, those helical piles were nice because frankly, they're very quick to install. You can see how most things are coming in as a module that are craned into place and then bolted into place. The two stacks there are the exhaust stacks for the gas turbine engines that are natural gas driven. You can see the coolers installed and the coordination of the timing of that, it doesn't look like there are that many people there. Um, but let's watch this one. This is a different location. Time-lapse of same fundamental construction of the station but this one's going to show a little bit more of the tie-in work. And oh, by the way, definitely take the time and the cost, because it's not that expensive, to get time-lapse videos set up for your location. I can't tell you how often that is helpful. Um, now, you will have inspection staff out there helping with construction, hopefully heading off a lot of those requests for information before they need to get back to the home office. But... Um, being able to look and see, let's say on a logistics side, did that tank get there yet? If that tank is sitting there, you don't have to bother anyone. The communication is seamless. Um, now, with every piece of hardware that you're seeing there, you're probably seeing a new contractor involved in some way, shape, or form, be it a vendor or different 
construction contractor. Every time you have multiple construction crews on site, you got to realize that there is a safety concern about them operating this big heavy equipment in confined spaces. It may not look confined, but trust me, it gets confined when you have multiple heavy pieces of equipment. And that boom on that excavator right there can swing so fast. If there's someone standing there and that boom swings, it will take them out and no one will even know what happened until they see somebody lying there and they're going to the hospital. So you gotta make sure all of that interface scope is covered from a business end, that there's no uncertainty in who is going to tighten this flange right there. This is the interface of to the left is one contractor, to the right is another contractor. Tightening that flange is about $10,000 worth of work. Yeah, got to get it right and got to get it right from a safety perspective. Um, so takeaways from the project, don't overcomplicate it. Scope, schedule, budget, build a team, have fun with that team. At any moment in time, everyone needs to know what to work on, have the tools to do it, the training to do it, and the materials to do it. Your job as project manager is to always be ahead of what's upcoming. Plan ahead and follow up and follow up again and follow up again and follow up again. And, you know, project controls focused individuals that are on the line. I know there's a lot of project controls tools out there that a lot of people would sell me to help me be a better project manager. And some of those will be helpful. But I personally, as a project manager, choose to have an action item list that I create that I track, that I execute. Because as soon as I hand that off to a project controls individual, I lose that ability to update it instantly. And I may need to update it tonight at 11. I probably will. Um, and at the same time, I'm not gonna bother that project controls person at 11. I'll bother them at 6 a.m. But have fun, teamwork, technical details matter, leadership matters a lot. And Frankly, commit to excellence. Establish that as an expectation in your project team. Establish it as an expectation for yourself and deliver it every single time. So, um, you know, if anyone wants to talk for another 17 hours, I'll uh, have to clear my calendar and I could probably do it. But uh, for now, I think uh, we probably should open up to Q&A and uh, see if there are any questions out there. Thank you very much. Dr. Peterson, we are now going to begin answering the questions submitted in the chat box. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the chat feature in your attendee control panel. Our what? first question is from Keenan. Given the future outlook of oil and gas infrastructure projects, do you foresee EPCs? engineering firms outsourcing more project elements overseas to operate more lean? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I work with, you know, I, I represent an engineering firm, but I partner with dozens of other engineering firms, some of whom do use overseas assets to execute some of what I'm going to call the less technical aspects of the project, more of the computer aided drafting aspects. Um, you know, there are legal requirements for engineering within the United States for licensure. And so one model that I have seen people execute effectively is they will have licensed individuals within the United States that are certified and educated, they're certainly licensed within the state in the United States. And then they will use global resources to execute that work. And, you know, much like we're talking today, you can execute effectively globally in today's world. But there are specific licensing requirements and there are definitely challenges to executing that work remotely only. The next question is from Sebastian Pierini. Can you speak to how you decide on training needs for your given large project? Yeah, very, very good. Um, my entire career personally has been spent 
in identifying weaknesses in my ability to execute and putting myself into project positions where I was forced to execute that scope of work. So any of my gaps in my knowledge then became strengths in my knowledge by the end of that project. On my project team or a project like this, I'm looking for a project team that has experts that I know are going to be driving the bus on that, and then they are going to have support staff. But I'm looking for them to have effective organization of how they're going to manage their individual team. Because if I have to manage their individual team, I don't have time to do that. So I'm hiring a manager who is hiring a team who is then going to manage the details of that training. But when I see the weaknesses in that team, because that's my role as the project manager. When I see those weaknesses, then I help that manager be more effective at managing their team and the training deficiencies that they have. And if they're frankly just not able to execute some scope of work, I'll have to make the decision of, do I bring in extra help to help them be effective? Do I bring in extra help to pull that scope from them? Or is that relationship just not very improved? Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Nassar. Uh, Nassar uh, asks, from your experience in mega projects, what are the dominant factors in project, in project failure to meet the cost schedule uh, plan? Yeah, very, very good question. So the primary failures of missing scope schedule or budget, frankly, is lack of establishing a good team that then you hold accountable or you have false expectations from the front. And what you'll find is if people have false expectations, they probably don't have the experience to understand the complexity of what their scope of work really entails. So when you have people that you identify that they don't recognize the challenges and are not able to get out in front of it, that's where teams start to fall apart. And that's where teams start to become defensive. And that's where you really got to be on your toes as project manager to stay ahead of it. Plan ahead, follow up. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Jess Matthias. Um, he says, as a follow-up to Nassar's question, would it be scope creep? I'm sorry, one more time. As a follow-up to Nassar's question, which is a question you just answered now, would it be scope creep? Yeah, so scope creep um, is generally not the issue. Uh, scope creep means the operations team decided that, you know what, we weren't planning on having uh, a connection to a different customer at that location, so we need to add that scope. That is added scope that generally is going to come with added budget because there's added value or you wouldn't be adding that component to the project. What many people perceive as scope creep is their lack of planning or lack of contract writing. So when a contractor comes to you and says, hey, Bill, we need to uh, tighten that flange. It's not in our scope of work, but somebody's got to do it. We'll tackle it for $10,000 for you. Um, knowing full well that maybe that's only a $5,000 scope of work, uh, then I as project manager go, shame on me. Yes, somebody has to execute that. But if they're trying to gouge me, I'll look them in the eye and I'll say, look, you know, yep, it's a scope of work that I didn't plan for, but I did build it into contingency in my budget. But look, you're not going to make a mint off change orders on me. I know it's a $5,000 scope of work. So do you. So, yep, we'll add that to your scope of work, but I'm going to pay you five grand. And if you want to charge me 10 grand, I'm going to the next contract. It's that simple. So scope, scope change is much less prevalent than what people think it is. It's usually somebody didn't plan ahead. Now, scope does happen. Scope change does happen. You have to reroute something. You have to buy a bigger piece of equipment. Those kinds of things, you got to react with grace and professionalism. But usually it's lack of planning. But we have time for one last question uh, from Antonio Lemos. Uh, his question is, have you ever performed a project complexity assessment? What do you think about it? Um, I have not done that. I haven't been associated with that. I, uh, I'm going to say I'd have to see what the tool is to understand its value. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peterson, uh, yeah. for a hey, great I presentation.
Um, it, it's been a pleasure having you with us. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And uh, good luck to everyone. And, you know, if uh, anyone wants to follow up, let me know you got a question. Be happy to follow up directly with you. Easy enough to chase down at Lake Spirit Consulting. Um, or I'm sure probably through ONA at ASEM. So. Yeah, so please uh, feel free to send me uh, any questions you may have for Dr. Peterson, or you can contact him directly. So this concludes the webinar for today. On behalf of ASEM, thank you all for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.